So we're going to start today with the uh, with the two poems that I I have I have here in my hand, and I'll play it for you in a second. Seamus Haney's "Digging" and Mary Oliver's this one. My work is loving the world, called Messenger as well, or officially called Messenger, and um, and you'll hear what I have to say about how they fit into our work of as students, as readers, for some of you as writers of poetry. And hopefully this will, this will be a productive and uh, interesting conversation for you. Okay. Hello, this is a bonus lecture for 194 Introduction to Poetry class. What is poetry section? In this brief lecture, I'll address two poems, Seamus Haney's Digging and Messenger, sometimes all first Loving the World by Mary Oliver. The poems include a few of the themes that we've already addressed. The resentment or notion of alienation and difference that the poetic speaker has versus is it lagging just for me or is it just lagging no it's lagging for everyone even, even. and finally the of vision and voice that the poetic sensibility affords let's start actually with messenger by mary oliver a recent poet died about two years ago American poet who writes in a free verse style without any clear meter, rhythm, or rhyme. And in her poem, Messenger, the title of which I actually learned from one of you, My Work is Loving the World, she writes quite insistently and clearly about this notion of labor and work. My work, she says, is what others may consider indolent, but it is to love the world. The world. And here, as we're taken uh, corona walk, we can join Mary Oliver in the kind of walk that she makes around the lush forest in her area. Here the sunflowers, the hummingbird, the blue pump. It's old, my coat torn, am I no longer young? Let me keep in mind on what matters, which is my work in any clear way of improving society, but rather on the work of the mind, the work of noticing, the work of attending, of paying attention. Perhaps indeed the most valuable, lucrative, uh, important asset that we have, especially in our day, but although Oliver was writing this a few decades back, paying attention, standing still, and learning to be astonished. In Oliver's language, to be a reader, to be a lover of poetry, is to be someone who is in love with the world, who retains that capacity for astonishment. To be astonished at the ordinary beauty of flower, the Phoebe, the Delphinium. Once again, as we've seen in the last few lessons, poetry can teach us to hear, to hear the poetry in ordinary conversation between friends, to hear the poetry in an ordinary note left in, a, left in the kitchen but also to see, to see the beauty of the meadow, to see the, the beauty of the wheelbarrow, and to see the beauty that surrounds us constantly. Shavis Haney's digging digs into the path, takes a different perspective in beauty. It also is bound up with the soil, with the lush earth of Ireland, Shavis Haney's homeland, Haney being a Nobel Prize winning poet of the late 20th century. And Haney also distinguishes himself from his ancestors, his father, his forefathers, his, his uh, father, his grandfather, his forefathers. He writes, between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean rasping sound, and the spade sinks into gravelly ground. My father digging, I look down. He notices too how different he is than his ancestors. And he doesn't take it as a, lump, as a mark of inferiority. He also doesn't look down upon his farmer, peasant, 
father and grandfather who works with a spade and rather takes note that his father and grandfather were able to dig up, to dig up from that Irish turf, the good turf, as he says, the cold smell of potato mold. He makes that, he makes that vocation, their work, palpable. He's able to notice through his power of poetry, through the power of his hand, what his father and grandfather were doing in a deep, significant way. I've no stage to follow men like that, men like, like them, Shaynes Haney writes, but between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. His pen remains an instrument of work, one of unearthing the past, unearthing experience, but one which allows him to write, to write experience, to bring up the past, to bring up the experience and emotion, the legacy of his ancestors. The people like his father, like his parents, the people who take note of what is written with that pen. Thank you. Some technical issues, sorry for that. It's, I think it's just the, actually my processor um, of the, the speed of my computer but because it, it, it lagged every time I was pressing on something here. Let's actually listen to Seamus Haney read it himself now, since uh, his voice is quite beautiful and resonant and his accent is fantastic. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean rasping sound, when the spade sinks into gravelly ground. My father, digging. I look down till his straining rump among the flower beds, bends low, comes up twenty years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills, where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug. The shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. My God, the old man could handle a spade, just like his old man. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf, digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awakened in my head. But I have no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. There's the inimitable Seamus Haney. I love the poem. It's, I think it's a terrific poem. It also is very representative of much of the kind of poetry written today. Nope, still going. And the... And although, although the, um, the poem, it also is a poem about poetry. Between my thumb and my, my finger, my thumb, the squat pen rests. Clearly, he's talking about his own calling as a poet. And as I mentioned, contrasting himself with his farmer father and grandfather. Just because we're reading it in the context of this week, it raises a con it raises a kind of comparative voice, a companion voice to the poem we just read on Monday, The Red Wheelbarrow, written a good 70 something years before, earlier, in which we'd, we remarked together, this is a, com re a review of what we talked about on Monday, there is no speak, there is no figure in the farm scene. There was only the stark image 
In this poem, it's all about farming, but about the speaker who sees himself outside of that tradition of husbandry, caring for the earth. He talks about digging, and he, and he makes metaphorical, explicitly so, makes metaphorical the work of digging, unearthing, turning over that rich earth, and how poetry becomes a kind of continuation of a different means of that same kind of work. So whereas last week with our first Irish poet, Yeats spoke con con self-consciously, somewhat resentfully about not being seen to do work, we then spoke on Monday about poetry and the difference of natural language, everyday language, and the workplace poem of the farmyard in Red Wheelbarrow. And just finishing up with these two poems, both of which address the notion of what it is to do work. And there's, I've, there are actually quite a few more poems of that theme that we could find, but these are both obviously about my work is to write. My work is to unearth that ground, or as Mary Oliver says, my work occurs in nature to bring people back into relationship with nature, to notice what is astonishing, to notice what is beautiful. My work is to notice and through language to help others take note. We're going to continue a, a bit more on this theme next week on Monday with the reading, the homework that you will do over the weekend with Roman Jakobson, a somewhat challenging piece of writing, a theoretical linguist, Roman Jakobson, who also writes about how language so often he is of this, of this school of thought, that language is constantly making simple, making easy, making um, invisible what is astonishing, what is beautiful, what is nuanced about the world. That's a theme we're going to refer, return to a few times over the next um, three weeks or so, but how language tends to do that. It tends to normalize. I was saying, remarking to Professor Kolbrenner just uh, yesterday or the, day, or the day before, how ordinary, how well you have all, how ordinary it seems to be in this Zoom context of Zoom classes how quickly you have all adapted to a quite insane situation. As I told you online when we first met two, week, two or three weeks ago for that orientation, nobody has ever done what you are doing, or at least no one's done it without understanding this is the kind of university we're going to. No one's done this by accident, so to speak, where you know, I see Michael still. Are you on a, are you on a train or a bus, Michael? You can, you can uh, give a thumbs up if it's a bus where you're taking classes from wherever it is that you are. Never yeah, yeah, I'm on a bus. On a bus. Going back I, mean, home. I mean, it's amazing that we can do this. On the one hand, it is amazing. On the second hand, let's just bear in mind how crazy it is and how normal it seems after only two weeks. That is what language is constantly doing to us also. We are a species. We have a culture. We have an incredible capacity to adapt to just about anything. And that is reflected in one of our great human conventions, which is language. Poetry is trying to undo that, to try to remind us of how astonishing the forest flowers are, to remind us of how incredible it was what our parents, our grandparents did, and how privileged we are to reflect on that. Um, I agree with Zara that you know this poem is about the di different generations, about different kinds of work. Certainly, paying tribute, he's not at all downplaying what his parents, what his grandfather, his father did, but also claiming respect for the the labor of what he does. Um, and in no way is superior, but in no way is the work of poetry anything inferior either. That question of hierarchies is also appropriate for um, appropriate for our next and our main emphasis for today. Our main emphasis for today is not a very earthy poem, although there is a pastoral, a natural element to it. It is Emily Dickinson's I Dwell in Possibility. You've watched the preparatory or the introductory video. I hope it was helpful and interesting for you. We can do this different ways. You can have just me talking with, uh, with uh, there were, obviously it was one of my kids shooting it. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll rope my wife in occasionally. I'll have, I'll have um, colleagues do it, but also there are 
there are uh, other resources since a benefit of studying what it is that you've chosen is that this kind of class has been taught in many, many different places. And we can, I can refer you to resources from all around the world of this kind of, this kind of class. I dwell on possibility. We have only three stanzas in this, in this text. So let me write down again who wishes to be our three speakers and let's let's try to get three new ones so i have a list of who's already spoke who's already done that who's already read but we only need a grand total of three so let's see hands either on the screen or on the participant list let me see uh, i have to get this off i don't see anyone raising hands yet are there people raising oh, there i see someone asala okay Sala, thank you okay asala and Yuval and Rahik. Rahik or Rahi? Okay, you'll tell me when you read, okay? You can, you can also, uh, if you want, you can say your name so everyone hears who you are when you're reading, because I know who you are. I can see everyone's pictures. Good. So we're going to do a, a Salah. We'll do the, we'll do the, uh, the first. And then, uh, who was second? Sorry, you, the, the screen moved. Yuval was two, I think. And Rahik was for the third stanza. I'm going to go to the poem now. It's relatively short but it has so much in it. I'm going to mute myself, and Asala, you can say your name and start the poem. I dwell in possibility. I dwell in possibility, possibility. a fair house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors. Of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye and for an everlasting groove the gambr gambrels of the sky of visiting the fields for occupation there the spreading right my narrow hands to gather paradise thank you excellent okay good work to sala yuval and rahik you've heard the questions that the other professor that um, that the professor asked at University of Pennsylvania, commonly called Penn, about what each of these terms in this poem, what it is to dwell, what it is, what it means to be superior for doors, all the very bizarre, the many bizarre phrases that Dickinson, who is want, who is accustomed to using these very vivid, but still somewhat abstract, like, you know, these are very uh, stark images, chambers as the cedars. Well, you know, this is exactly what Billy Collins was talking about in that, the, um, that advertisement video that we saw to last week. You know, I speak English. This poem, this poem is in English. I can figure out what these words mean. Either I know them or I can look them up. And yet I have no idea what any of this, what mo most of this means. I have the sense of a chambers of cedars. Okay, but I've never seen a chamber of cedars impregnable of eye. An everlasting root, the great gambrels of the sky. It's a little hard to follow. You heard the answers that the other students in America were given. A visitor's the fairest for occupation. This, this, the spreading my narrow hands to gather paradise. I'm going to open up to, to comments in a second. Clearly. And you had this both in the video and just from your own interpretation of this text. I'm going to stop the share now that, so I can simply see you. The poem is about poetry itself in perhaps the most explicit way other than Collins' introduction of poetry and Yeats. This is obviously exclusively about poetry, not about poetry in relationship to parents or poetry in relationship to work, but poetry. Poetry, however, in relationship to another category of writing the other large category of writing that i named on monday which is to say prose and she says i dwell in possibility the general the large metaphor of the poem is that it is a house that is obvious to us we know that from again the re those the, the class conversation the pre-record the recorded one as well as what you understand and a lot of these terms in this complicated long metaphor we'll talk about the kind of metaphor uh, in about two in about next week or two weeks a conceit that was a term that al phil reese used the professor in that video used a conceit it has doors it has windows 
chambers, which is which is another word for rooms, as a roof, and it also at the end will have visitors. So there's a lot built into this metaphor, but it's all a metaphor of her writing, or her, as she calls it, her occupation, her dwelling. Al Filri ended talking about a kind of elitism, and that's where hierarchies do come into play in this poem. There are various hierarchies of, I dwell in possibility, possibility being fairer than prose, a fairer house than prose. So where she lives is fairer. You heard them talking about fairer, both equitable and also more, more beautiful. And then there's visitors. Her visitors are, again, the fairest. So there's a kind of ranking of both what, where she is, her home, and the visitors. That's all I want to say. So you've heard a lot of preparatory material for a very complex poem. I hope this enables us to have a fruitful conversation now. We have time for about 10 minutes or so, maybe a little more, to talk about it. If you want to refer, as Sarah's uh, commenting in chat, about her own background, I know that there's an Apple TV show about Emily. I've never seen it, but students last year told me about it. She had a very idiosyncratic personal biography, unusual personal biography. You could talk about that if you wish, or you can just stick, as all of us can understand, to the words on the page, even as strange and both clear and strange as they are. Okay, so let me get uh, gather some comments if people want to raise hands again, either on the side in your participants, you can do that there, or you can do it on the on the uh, the sheet. Let me see if there are any comments. And then also the end, you know, someone was just waving their hands. I didn't notice though. So there's that very striking, but again, unusual conclusion to this text. Gathering, uh, what should you say about her hands? Spreading wide my narrow hands. So this is classic Dickinson, in the sense that, or Emily, if you wish to call her. So succinct, so economical, and both so clear and in some ways mysterious. To spread wide my hands, to gather in paradise. I know what each of those words mean. I can understand the phrase. I don't know exactly what she means. Maybe you do. Okay, so who wants to touch on any of this? Danielle, you've already unmuted yourself, so I don't know if that was purposeful or not, oh, but you I can have the floor. Pay attention. Okay. Um, well, from what I understand, she lives in possibility, which means poetry, right? Um, and she thinks poetry is better than prose, obviously, and it's like a, a better house than prose. Um, it has many rooms and many windows. It means that it has more options than prose. Maybe it's more open and prose is more limited. And uh, the visitors part, um, maybe the readers. So the readers are different uh, in a way. They are more open maybe. Uh, um, open to new ideas or something like that. Okay, uh, good. Let's 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 talk let's talk about some of the ideas that Danielle. Thank you for for starting us off. Um, and that's a hard thing to do with a challenging text like this. I think without question, the hard, most challenging one we have read thus far. We'll have others, but Dickinson, Dickinson, as a professor of mine said many years ago, and I might repeat this later in the semester, there are a few poets who say so little but demand so much of their readers. That's also actually in the poem, by the way, that, that notion that she really forces you to think, think really hard, and she expects her readers to be able to do so. Danielle said a few things, and we're going to go to the other Danielle, Danielle Stephen, in a second, but the, but the, the text raises both uh, two things that I, I want to note for everyone in what Danielle said. Text seems, the house in which she dwells seems to be very open, open to the sky, it has all these windows, um, superior for doors, uh, yeah, superior for doors, and yet much of what is mentioned about the structure of this building, roof, doors, windows, are barriers. It seems very open, but everything that is, everything that is described about it 
is a kind of barrier. A window is, it keeps their points of egress or access or um, closure. Second, and what Danielle said is something that Al Philrice raised. What is the comparison being made? It is not entirely spelled out. Danielle said, well, she dwells seemingly in poetry, but not in prose. She never actually says the word poetry. She says the more obscure word prose. Dickinson does. The speaker also never makes clear. I dwell in possibility. What well, possibility is compared to what? As prose is compared to what? That was what Al Philrice called the ratio, the kind of uh, analogy being made here. And perhaps those two points are ones that we can talk about. Danielle, Stephen, please. Uh, based upon the more windows than doors, I actually think the windows represent uh, more perspectives in the way that poetry is not like like prose, like a door, which is like yes or no, you know, whereas poetry has, it's open to more interpretations. So I think the many windows can represent the interpretations, the perspectives, how you can look at the text, how you can view her in her dwelling, in her occupation, something like this. Excellent, excellent. So the windows could be the many perspectives on this text um, or on a, on a text of poetry. Good. Yuval and then uh, Danielle. Oh, I guess there are three Danielles in this class. Excuse me. Yuval, Yuval and then uh, Danielle Perry and then back to Danielle Balloon. Oh, and tomorrow. Sorry, I didn't see you. And then tomorrow after that. Okay. All right. Um, I was also thinking with um, the windows compared to the doors is that um, with the windows, you could see through them. So uh, many people outside the house, let's say, could see in it, you could read the poem, you could see the poem, but doesn't mean you necessarily understand what the poem means. So once you get through the door, through the barrier, and open up the poem, you could finally understand what she's trying to say, what um, the message she's trying to get to. Excellent. Good, good. So again, the windows, so you've all agreed with Danielle Stephen that the windows are a way of seeing into it. Um, kind of a perspective, so to speak, on the text, whereas the door seems, I don't know, something entering into it, a different level of access. Good. Danielle Perry? Hey. Um, I do think, it, I really do think it also symbolizes people and the environment she's in um, because of the house that she's describing. But also as far as the windows and the seeing through, uh, she does say something about that the roof is the sky. There's So the sky is also a symbol for no limit, I think. So in her house, there's no limit, even with the windows and the doors. And also in the video, they were speaking about the doors. So maybe there are locks. And I think it's about her having the key to all of these doors, no matter how many doors there are, she has the key to open them, nobody else, because this is her territory. And also, when I first saw the word fair, maybe it's my complications with myself, but my first thought was fair skin. And yeah, it symbolizes beauty, but it also symbolizes status. So I think it's higher status, middle, higher class, and those are her visitors also. So that's why I also thought it symbolizes people. When she, she says that um, about the house also, right? The prose, fairer house than prose. So yes, that's what I thought. Excellent. Very good. Um, I want to say two things. First of all, fair has this connotation of being more beautiful. My fair lady, uh, what a fair weather we're having today. It means like fine. And the reason that light skin is sometimes called or has been in British uh, English called fair skin is because of racism, right? That white skin, pale skin is considered beautiful. Yeah, because you, many, many it, was a, it was a sign that, yeah, you're not the slave, but also that you don't work outside, that you are indoors, mm -hmm. you have people doing for you. Precisely. And so that's just a sort of a, a random or arbitrary, um, arbitrary choice that many, many centuries of... Uh, of people made about you know women and what was considered what was considered lovely. I love this, I, but I like this idea that as Danielle says, Danielle Perry says about the the openness even in this structure, and then likewise this idea that the house is her private space. This is a very exceptionally private person. Um, that's something that you know Sarah mentioned her idea that she was kind of a recluse. She did not publish during her life, but she was also someone who wrote poetry um, 
in voluminous, voluminous uh, poems. And someone who um, clearly had a very cl clear idea about both herself and human nature. Tamara, you were next, and then Itamar. I, I just, this time when I read the poem, um, the chambers as the cedars and the gambrels of the sky caught my eye more than they did the previous time. Um, I'm not sure she's actually inviting anyone to come in uh, upon my, my reading of the poem now. I think that when she says fairer house than prose, she's, you know, she's comparing two things that a human being could look at, but the fairest, the visitors being the fairest with the open gambrels of the sky, I think that she might only be inviting something heavenly or divine in to to actual, actually visit her. And because she was so reclusive and possibly elitist in her, who, who she allowed to interpret her poetry, she might not be saying um, that my house is open to anyone at all. I, I'm, I'm curious if uh, the idea is that she really only is inviting, you know, she refers to paradise as well, which is a divine sort of theme. Um, maybe no one's allowed to come in except for the absolute highest of uh, interpreters, the angels, the heavens, the... Certainly certainly a valid a, a valid reading. You know, it's it, these, although it's such a short poem, and again, I keep saying the same thing, the words are so clear, it is open to all these parts. That is a that is a very justified reading and um and one that you know if you if you were to write an entire essay that could be an approach that you would take and over a course of two or three pages introduce uh evidence to support it and ask itamar and then danielle and then zara and then maybe uh, we'll go back so itamar then danielle balul zara um for me what was interesting about the world well the fairest or uh, fairer was it fairer or fairest? Uh, yeah, anyway. So first she's a fairer and then fairest at the end. So uh, if I interpret the world as more just or uh, equitable, then the first thought like instinctively, I think, wait, poetry is not more just uh, or more true to reality than uh, prose. Uh, in poetry, you could lie. I could uh, say nonsense, but after after thinking about it a little bit more, I feel like uh, perhaps what she's trying to say is the possibility of speaking complete nonsense is uh, what allows uh, what allows her to say things that are more uh, just and fair. Uh, because they couldn't be said with uh, just pure reason and logic. But so this that somewhat contradictory not. text and the poetic, the poetic language allows her to say truths that she could not otherwise either allow herself to write or to put into words. The poetry allows you to uh, write uh, sentences that aren't uh, logically valid, but still hold to. Good. And I like this idea that you're reading it tomorrow and we, you would, we would need to sharpen it a bit, but that you're making a connection between the two different and the two different um, connotations of the meanings of the word fair. One, beautiful, kind of aesthetic quality. And the other one, just, as in justice, a moral quality. And for Dickinson, perhaps those are related or maybe even the same. That which is beautiful, that which is aesthetically, aesthetically pleasing, the poem as a whole, perhaps, a piece of art, also has moral quality to it. It also has a virtue to it in the sense of justice, of being correct, of being right, of being fair. Good. Danielle, and then Zara, and then we'll we'll bring this to a to a close. And anyone else who wants, wants to jump in is welcome to do so before we finish. Okay, so the windows, through windows, we can see the world outside. So maybe these windows are her options to look outside to communicate with the world. Because she's in the house and 
maybe she doesn't have to leave it. She can just communicate with the world through the windows. She sees through the windows. That's I'm, it. As I'm constantly telling my son, you know, uh, you know what you can, if you can see something out through a window, if you can see someone, they can also see you. You can see both <laughs> ways. Uh, right. The windows, the windows are, are, are bi-directional. Right. So it's not only a way for other people to see in, but she can also see out into the world. And as Sarah mentioned, or other of you may know, Dickinson was someone who lived almost exclusively at home, almost very, rare, very rarely went out. She lived on this little estate where there were actually several houses, her house, her brother's house, and the, Ever, the Evergreens estate. And she, in Amherst, an old town of sort of originally Puritan New England and Massachusetts, and her house was very important to her, where she lived, the structure of this house, the garden, but also poetry, of course. And her real home was not necessarily the house, the structure in which she lived, but this artistic, what she calls her occupation, the place that she occupies. It is also a reference to the same theme that we've developed earlier today of work. Occupation is your line of work. It is also what occupies her time. And she occ occupies the cell, the space, like, you know, like occupation of uh, filling space. Good. Um, last few comments here I see. There was, after Dinya Balul, I was going to remind me, it was Zara. Zara Sandos, Zara Sandos, and that might be about it. Zara. Yeah, uh, in terms of the last part, when she said the fairest, um, I thought about it in terms of, uh, only the people who know and who can interpret poetry because uh, back then, maybe for most people, poetry was just something nice to look at, but only those who had like a deeper reading of things could uh, be able to interpret and see through poetry and not necessarily people who were rich or well-established because poetry, um, in times can be narrated, it was uh, in, at a certain times uh, oral thing. So she maybe mean the people who can, you know, analyze it well. And in terms of occupation, this is pretty why my narrow hands together paradise, uh, she could possibly mean that poetry is superior to other genders, genders of reading, uh, of writing, because um, with it, she has like a superior way of, of expressing things which will lead eventually to paradise once the reader analyzes. Well, as all, as, thank you so much, Sarah. Beautiful comment. Sondos, and then uh, unless anybody else has something final to say, I'll wrap up this poem mm -hmm. and our lesson for today. I think that the prose is uh, the opposite of poetry and according to the wide windows she wants to let people in but not just any people more specific people maybe more special people uh, but yet we're looking at the locks at the doors she is very conservative about herself that's what I think and the chambers of cedars it's not the wood it's the height of the wood that she describing that the chambers is very high, like in a superior way. Um, she her home is very special to her, to according to the structure and the, the way she describe it. Yeah, that's it. That is so important, Sondos, and thank you for mentioning that. It's another one of these double meanings in the text. Just as there's fairer, there also is superior, which connotes it suggests two different things. One is superior, the everyday meaning of better in a kind of ranking system. And there's a lot of that in this poem. And I want to, I'll connect it to what Zara is saying that although it is on one hand, a very uh, elitist poem, it is a poem, which is a very democratic way of speaking. It is open and accessible to everyone. Um, and that also relates to the final thing I'm going to say today about Kenneth Koch's, Kenneth Koch, uh, Kenneth Koch's essay about a language within a language. But Sondos, you're also mentioning that superior is not just better in ranking, but it is also higher. The superior court, or you know, it means the high court, the 
a sense of it being superior as being above, high up. And that is the structure of her house. It's not just a fancy house. It is. It certainly has these many um, windows. Has, it also has these strong doors. You guys mentioned the locks that, brought, that were brought up in the pen conversation from Modpo. Um, by the way, those, those, that group sitting around discussing poems has an entire online course that they did many years ago. I think about more than 11 years ago. And it's a, they call it Modern Poetry, Modpo. They have an entire platform built on mod po mod modern poetry. And they begin with Dickinson as sort of the uh, precursor, the prototypical first modern poet in America. They, they do American modern poetry and then they go up through the 21st century. And so some of these poems, some of these texts are, some of these uh, excuse me, terms in this poem, the description of the house, as Asava said, yes, it has many windows. It is very fancy. It has all these rooms, but she seems to be the only one there. It is where she lives. It is the place, the space that she occupies. And I actually think we have, maybe we have time for one or two more comments because I just want to ask one more thing is, well, prose is clearly, she says, a fairer house than prose. So she lives in the house of prose as opposed to the house of poetry, although she doesn't name poetry. But she says that actually she dwells in possibility. And that, of course, raises the question, and this was brought up, the, 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 uh, the pen people talked about this. What is the difference of possibility? Restriction, limitation? What is it that poetry, if poetry is analogous or related to possibility, what is it that allows? But the place that she lives in, is that's the, the, the comparison. I dwell in possibility, which seems to be poetry, and it is a fairer house than prose where things have to happen. One thing leads to another. Not anything can happen. There is, of course, narrative. Things have to happen one after another. There's cause and effect. And poetry is not like that. It's just language. It's just voice. It's just personality, emotion, and and words. Um, Aura, her, uh, we'll see this often because we're going to have quite a few Emily Dickinson poems. She uses what even in her time, which is 160 years ago, 1860s, 1870s, um, she uses a very outdated form of capitalization. It was not standard even in her, in her own day, although English did this long before because the rules of grammar were still not established even in her time. And she, uh, and she uses them often for concepts or words that she wishes to emphasize, but her form of writing capitalization, her M dashes, all that is part of her writing. She just, she rarely uses standard punctuation or spelling. Leo, do you want to have the last word? You can unmute yourself and speak, or you can just shake your head no. But I saw you want to speak a minute ago. Leah. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, she uses a lot of juxtaposition throughout the poem, and, well, especially more numerous of windows and then impregnable of eye. And... I think that's like numerous of windows, so there are so many interpretations of poetry. It, the draft business adds to the mystery of poetry, but also, yeah, more numerous of windows, so many interpretations and impregnable of the eye. You can't really, because when you look with your eyes, you can only like see one clear thing. And so, I mean, yeah, I guess that means it's impregnable of the eye because you can't really see what, one thing that it means because there are so many different ways of looking at it it's not like straightforward like with eyes or, like with seeing good thank you so yes there are all the so even in this short text and i think i'm glad you guys noticed this since i i am someone who also pays a great deal of attention to the the um i say to the con to the internal contradictions, which I tend to say, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm almost always, I'm almost always convinced are done purposefully by the, by the poet. They are implanted there. The, the notion that the fairer house means these two different things, which might themselves be contradictory to superior. It is a place in which she lives, but with, and she calls it visitors, but it seems, and I agree with Tamara from early on, not very inviting, and I think Azano is also correct that it is a kind of writing that anyone can take up. Here's a woman living in a very traditional society, um, and anyone who knows anything about Emily Dickinson knows how idiosyncratic, how individual she was, how contrary to the 
General Morris and her her father's um, bearing, she was, and she's there seemingly all alone. The final three lines in the, the striking image of the spreading wide my narrow hands. Well, there you have the contradiction, or you have the paradox or the contrast made vividly clear. Spreading wide my narrow hands. Well, is it wide or narrow? Here is someone at this time still a relatively young woman when she writes this, sitting down in some private space in her actual house and entering into, in a way, a house within that house, within the actual place she lives, the Evergreens, the, the state on the main street in Amherst, ent entering into the private space of her writing, of her art, of her extraordinary thoughts, her astonishing world of her mind where with just a few scraps of paper and, and her writing was done on you know little little scraps of paper and that's what was gathered up in another way after her life those stacks were themselves a kind of paradise of poetry she would write and write and write and gather forth or gather paradise together gather maybe the world of an afterlife the world of another the not, a next world Maybe a, in a religious sense, she is a religious person, but a very individually, a very, um, a very uh, reform-minded, and uh, uh, you know, again, this is part of her biography. She had her own individual ideas about, you know, again, iconoclastic ideas about faith and about God, and she would see things maybe through those windows that few others did, and. She would be very private, and she was very private, about letting people see in. Now, there's so much of this that seems to me indicative of the nature of the poetic sensibility. Here, there was someone, all these different things that we've talked about over the, our first two weeks of what is poetry. An ability to see those windows, an ability to take note, astonish, the astonishment, as, as Mary Oliver said, to pay attention. And the desire to communicate, as Marcella was making clear, and also was in Adam's Curse by Yeats. The craft of writing and writing so that it can reach some other person. Those visitors maybe being other poets, maybe being readers, the ideal readers. That's how Al Philrice understood it. Maybe being us, but only the fairest. It can be anyone, but only the ones who approach with both justice, kind of fairness in their hearts, open-mindedness, but also an appreciation for beauty, the fair readers, fair visitors. These are the people who, who, will, who can gain access to this. It is both a very elitist poem, about poetry being higher, superior, fairer, but it's also open to the world, impregnable of eye, I don't even know to this day, after having read this you know, dozens, hundreds, maybe up to scores of times, I don't know what that means. We see these words on the page, but we don't see into the speaker's soul. We don't see through the language entirely. Someone, Zara, I think it was, spoke a few weeks ago, at the, uh, last week, at the beginning of our deliberations, of our conversations about the density of language. As clear as these words are on the page, the black and white on the screen, for us, or if you've printed it out, we don't see all the way through it. These few words remain somehow impregnable to us. There is more. There are more chambers. There are more levels. There are more rooms behind us. The space of poetry is in some ways infinite. To conclude for today, I said how the, she enters into a house within her house. Let me share now the, um, just a, f a bit of the, of the uh, Kenneth Koch essay. I know it's long. You will, 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 I'll, I'll also put a few questions on the worksheet about this one so you have a chance at least to respond to it and deal with this essay. Kenneth Koch himself, a late 20th, early 21st century American poet who, uh, who died, again, not that long ago, maybe about a decade ago. Poetry is often regarded as a mystery. Well, here in this poem of dwelling in possibility, we obviously had that sense. 
in some respects, it remains one. No one is quite sure where poetry comes from. No one's quite sure exactly what it is. And no one really knows how anyone is able to write it. You can see why I'm sharing this at the end of our little unit on what is poetry. Best to say this at the end of the beginning, as opposed to the essay you read last week, where everyone's, where it was declared at the outset, the thesis was, well, we all know what poetry is. It's just hard to define it. Here he's saying, well, no one really knows what it is. It comes from some mysterious place. And beautiful Coke being a poet uses a uses a metaphor taken from another poet, a favorite poet, poet of his, Paul Valéry, a French poet. One way to get a little more clarity on the subject was, this, was suggested to me by a remark of Paul Valéry. Valéry said that what could be expressed in poetry but not elsewhere, thinking about what, he, what could be expressed in poetry but not elsewhere, he said that poetry was a separate language, more specifically, a language within a language. There is ordinary language, and then somehow within the boundaries of syntax, the boundaries of vocabulary, within English or French or Arabic or Hebrew or any language, there is the language of poetry, a separate language within that language. I want to continue driving, and we'll continue talking about that for our last conversation on Monday, our half conversation, half of our class on Monday, about that very topic. And Jakobsen, from a linguistic perspective, will write about that. What distinguishes this poem, this category of language, from the others? We've seen that already. It was already in that first, that first text of Adam's Curse, or one of our first texts, Adam's Curse, how poetry tries to have that standard of natural language, of an ordinary conversation, it has to seem effortless, but takes a great deal of work. William Carlos Williams seemingly offhand remark to his spouse or his wife about leaving, taking the breakfast food, the red wheelbarrow, and then, of course, again, today, where the house is very different than ordinary speech, but is a language within that language, a house within the house where she writes, the gathering paradise, the work of what poets do. Um, that's what I want to share with you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to share with you guys for today. I hope we can aspire to continue becoming those of visitors, the fairest, the kind of people who can enter into that space. It is open to everyone. It can only be done with effort. But as, uh, as Dickinson makes clear, it is a space that we can enter into, even from the narrow world of an online community, community even from the narrow space, whatever, however much space we have in our very constricted world of, of Corona 2020. And we'll continue on that, on that path. We'll continue on doing that work next week. I'll, you can see it online later today, and you'll have it posted to, your, to, you, ne to you later in the day or latest tomorrow, homework for next week, and uh, readings for week three. You'll find it under that button, and we'll, we'll, under, we'll embark on our next section of our course, in the second half of our class Monday. I wish you guys a pleasant weekend. As once as always, I'll stick around here if anybody wants to talk to me. And thank you guys for your attention. And you guys can hang out and talk to each other as well. You're welcome to do so as to do so. Take care. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Bye. Thank you.